um, innovation in the sense of developing new things, not necessarily like global innovation. Yeah. In my case, so it's like uh, the fact that developing railways or airports or all these public assets is not uh, getting there for many years now. But I'm not looking on the in, in, on technological innovations. No. It's actually about uh, Mali's brothers. same time I mean like we like is that we have to get this uh, sorted uh, this, this, this conflict is sorted you know, probably we need to bring some kind of development in the state so we can maybe break up the vicious circle of inner development and, 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 and conflict and how do you balance security and development so it's just um, and it's from that angle
Yeah, yeah, that's Hi, right. Nice Hi, nice to meet you. Um, <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. started to like uh, to think about it. <laughs> I mean, um, so uh, yeah, we start to look into how kind of implementation measures are different in these like comparable like protected environments. Okay. We were surprised to find this some like uh, to find out that this is something that on which there has been very little work. But then Clemato is given the the tool that worked in earlier like cross country paper. Which, which is, I think, the only like it's about the only paper that we could cite. <laughs> oh my God! And it's like, to be fair, it's like really that's like this this relatively unsurprising finding that like it's more expensive to build stuff in, in conflict and like protected environments because it's like underneath. The, I guess that stylized tech works like the whole budget. Question about yeah, why does it get built in some case and not get built in other ones? What's the selection? But what are what exactly are you doing in Brazil? Uh, so there I do the work transfer, the transfer of the city and the architecture. Yeah. Um, and we have you know very broad experience of working with the whole city and the city yeah. construction yeah. Um, procurement yeah. or everything in terms of building it, or um, property donation as well. So it's for the planning side. So in the program yeah. there was like a uh, okay. Uh, what time is it now? Two forty or five? Um, we're just waiting for John Kim. Hi, I'm not uh, from India. Thank you, country. Uh, okay. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Nice Doctors meet you. and doctor yeah. is very fond of to say what okay. he's doing. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just jealous you want the cakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 the real value is in the network. You know, you need real networks. Yeah. I think that you have two meetings this session. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I just. Yeah, yeah, so we was worked on in there, and I, I think uh, I had a Skype call with him while he was in Istanbul like a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. No, we tried at some point working with Linux clusters together. Yeah. So we have a new work in the world of Fortnite. Oh, Fortnite. Yeah. yeah. Are like closely linked to a full ensemble. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, 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 always, they always seem to be just one like project ahead. Like, unfortunately, I have this like, like sectarian interest in the Maoist conflict. Otherwise, they like, like, uh, we realize that yeah, our research is done. It's like overlapped by territory.
I wanted just uh, quickly to welcome you to this session, particularly on, on behalf of the country director uh, of our India program, Dr. Pranav Sen. Uh, the India program, India Central uh, program, is one of two that we have in India, the other being India Bihar, which is led by Dr. Gupta and uh, Professor Mukherjee. And the India Central program is really, I think, our most active a program uh, on a number of different metrics. It's been a, a source of a large number of influential papers um, and a source of active debate. It's the birthplace of Ideas for India, which is far and away the most successful blog in the sort of IGC stable. Um, so it's been a, a great program uh, for the IGC. And the focus today is on uh, an important issue for the IGC. In fact, the focus of our public lecture on Tuesday by Dr. Kabaruka and Professor Collier on infrastructure, which, as some of you may know, featured prominently today in the Prime Minister's uh, speech about make the make the make in India policy. So infrastructure is clearly an important issue uh, in India, as it is in virtually all of our partner countries. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Monte Singh and Lalia, who will be chairing the panel this evening, uh, this afternoon. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Well, I have a very easy job, and that is to get on with the business. Uh, our main speaker, Professor Oliver Van den Ender, uh, uh, comes to us from two distinguished universities, the Professor of Economics, the Paris School of Economics. There's actually a mistake in the program. It's assistant professor. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, and is also visiting uh, professor at the at Princeton University. So without further ado, uh, Oliver, let me request you to make uh, your presentation. Sit there. So you can. I'll be okay. I can see from this. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to, to present um, our, our project, which is uh, joined with uh, Jake Shapiro at Princeton. So the primary goal of this project is actually relatively simple. We just try to construct an integrated and geocoded data set of all the infrastructure projects that have been uh, taking place in India under the umbrella of a few really big flagship programs. And so we try to map these projects at the village level. So that's kind of the, the kind of uh, instrumental uh, research goal that we, we have in this project. Now, related to that, we are particularly interested in a, a, a smaller set of research questions, which we hope to answer eventually with the data that we're collecting. And those research questions, they relate very strongly to the, the, the personal research background that uh, I myself and that, that, that Jake have, which is on the, the uh, development challenges in what is known as India's Red Corridor, which is a set of about 100 districts uh, that, are, are, uh, that are experiencing uh, a, a relatively low intensity uh, conflict that has been going on for uh, almost 60 years. So the big questions we're interested in in that context is first of all, um, how should we think about successful program completion in these particular conflict affected areas? 
area of Bithynia, and also what would the impacts be of these uh, rural infrastructure programs on local conflict outcomes. Now, just to be a bit more precise of the types of infrastructure we're considering, so under this project we're looking at uh, electrification programs, road construction, um, the construction of telecom towers, improvements in rural drinking water, and uh, kind of uh, a, a more flexible and smaller scale program called the Integrated Action Plan. And so the first four of those programs under the previous government were uh, brought together under the umbrella of the Barak Nirman campaign. And just to give you a sense of the, the importance and the magnitude of these projects, they account for about uh, an, an annual spending of uh, one, one billion dollars. And in terms of, of magnitude, that's actually comparable to the, the well-known uh, MN uh, REGA uh, program, so the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Um, and as, 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 as was already hinted at during the introduction of, of, uh, of, of uh, Professor Lieb, it's not very hard to motivate work on infrastructure. So it's clear that infrastructure development is one of the most important areas of public investment and of economic aid. And even even though this is, these, these, uh, these, uh, these um, topics are hugely important, it's actually fair to say that in the, in the, in the development literature, compared to other topics, there has, not, there has not been that much work on measuring impacts of in infrastructure development or understanding the, the completion process. And if we think about kind of the, the global set of, um, of, of, of environments in, the, in which we can think about studying infrastructure development, India really stands out for a number of reasons. And the, the first is, 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 a, is a very natural one in the, in, the, in, the, in the Indian context, but obviously the scale of these programs is really unparalleled. So if we think about these centrally funded large-scale flagship programs, they often target hundreds of thousands of villages. What's also very interesting in the Indian context is that for the programs that we're looking at, which are programs that are, imp that are kind of launched by the central government, those programs have tended to rely, at least in theory, on objective selection criteria. And obviously, such a project allocation mechanism gives rise to a lot of opportunities for an empirical impact evaluation by researchers. What's also interesting about the programs in the Indian context is that even if the central government provides the funding of these programs, the implementation is often delegated to the state governments. And that actually uh, allows us to make comparisons um, about project implementation between different political environments. Another aspect where India stands out is that for these projects, the, the monitoring um, kind of infrastructure has been relatively impressive um, in the sense that for each of these programs, there was a very deliberate effort to document all the activities that, that took place. And we can talk about, about kind of the, the quality of that data, but it's, it's kind of the first, a first and necessary step for being able to study these programs is obviously having data on their uh, implementation. And finally, what's particular about the, the set of infrastructure programs that we're looking at as, as well is the fact that they, they were independently implemented, meaning that there was no explicit coordination between different infrastructure uh, programs, which may have led to important inefficiencies on the one hand, but on the other hand, for researchers, it also enables us to uh, separately uh, <coughs> identify impacts and complementarities between these, pro uh, these uh, rural infrastructure projects. And then finally, I mean, as I hinted at earlier, there's a a kind of more narrow question that we are interested in, which is quite important nevertheless, which is how do you provide infrastructure to conflict zones? It's, it's, it's valid knowledge that India's Maoist insurgency for, for a large, uh, to an important extent, is a development challenge. But it's, we are not clear how we should balance uh, development and security approaches. And obviously we want to bring, or the Indian government wants to bring these conflict zones into the economic mainstream by providing infrastructure, but there are very particular challenges to doing that, and we, we are not really sure 
how eligibility for rural infrastructure programs affects the conflict outcomes that we're interested in in the uh, short or medium term. Now, in the remainder of the talk, I will just give a bit more background about the programs that we're taking into account, and I will then move on to a, a, a relatively descriptive analysis of completion processes in uh, India's uh, districts that are affected by uh, so-called left-wing extremism. Um, and just to highlight some of the preliminary findings that, that, that I, I will gather towards the end of this, this, this talk, I, I will basically show that uh, there are particular implementation challenges, and we can see that in the data. We can also, we also find suggestive evidence of the fact that the patterns of completion in conflict zones are different for different types of infrastructure, and they also differ uh, according to the, the, the kind of completion metric that, that you consider. So just to, to, uh, to, to, to take one step back in this presentation, so the way we, we have the way we have started to, to um, the way in which we have started this effort to collect information on these different infrastructure programs is that in each case we've started, of course, by uh, browsing through what was publicly available on, on the relevant government websites. It became clear very, very soon that that information was often incomplete and that there was actually relatively little information on how to interpret program implementation. So even if there was a formal rule, it was not really clear how that rule was implemented on the ground. And so as part of this project, we started a discussion with uh, the departments who were responsible for implementing each of these programs, just to talk and understand like, about how exactly they applied the, the formal uh, selection criteria when they implemented the program, and also to uh, address any gaps that existed in the, uh, in the online data. <coughs> um, one, one first project that we've started to collect data on is the so-called Universal Service Obligation Fund. And this is a, a, a fairly big program under which the central government uh, provides subsidies for commercial telecom providers to build towers in rural villages that have no prior telecom coverage. And so under this program, more than 7,000 towers have been built all across India. And you can find the, the kind of, you can see the location of these towers on a map of India on uh, this slide. Now, interestingly, especially for a, from a research design perspective, when the government um, kind of uh, selected villages to be covered by the first phase of uh, USOP, they also asked the technical consultant to come up with a list of villages that could be covered under the second phase. And those villages are, are uh, added in blue on the next map. However, those towers were actually never built. For some reason, the second phase was actually uh, closed off, um, which, which, um, which may be unfortunate from a, from a development perspective, but from a, a research design perspective, this is actually a, a very kind of uh, fortunate uh, um, outcome in the sense that it, it actually allows us to compare the kind of the villages that received treatment under the first program to villages that could have received treatment under the second program, and, but that are very comparable in terms of their kind of uh, economic characteristics. And so that is something that we, we hope to do later on in this project. A second uh, big infrastructure program that we look at is an, an, a rural electrification program, the Rajiv Gandhi Gramin Vidyutika Yojana, uh, or RGDBY. So this is a program under which previously unelectrified villages are connected to the electricity grid. Um, and, and this was kind of the main purpose of the program under the 10th plan. In later plans, this program actually became a bit more comprehensive in the sense that it also uh, targeted villages that had some prior connection to the electricity grid, but it just uh, provided higher quality connections and it also uh, moved on or expanded to providing connections to uh, BPL households. So again, we've started to collect data on this on these program and we've started to map the information we collected at the village level. So just for the purpose of, of kind of, uh, of, of, of visually making this, uh, this, 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 this program uh, just to be able to visualize
visualize this program, I just zoom in on Chucky's car here, and uh, the yellow dots here indicate where uh, villages receive treatments uh, under the, the RGDDY program. Now, what you can actually do by mapping infrastructure data at the village level is you can actually compare at the lowest possible administrative level whether a village got treated by one program or two programs or no program at all. And if you do that, you actually see here that the villages that receive treatment under the electrification program in yellow tend to be different from the villages that receive treatment under the uh, telecom program. And this may not be this may not be a large concern because, after all, each program had its own selection criterion. But what's interesting here is that um, even if you kind of zoom in on, on villages that were initially unelectrified, about, <coughs> about 53, uh, 53 of those in Chhattisgarh, um, so there are 53 villages in Chhattisgarh that received a, a telecom tower under use of and that were not electrified at baseline, and only five of those were treated by RGDDY, which means that we are left with about uh, like 50 districts or a bit less than 10% of the total, uh, sorry, uh, 50 villages or a bit less than 10% of the villages treated by USOF who received the telecom tower but did not have uh, a proper uh, connection to the electricity grid. And this start from talking to um, the, 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 uh, the implementing agencies was a very big challenge because it meant that they needed to bring in diesel generators in these villages to be able to tower, uh, to, to power the electricity, uh, the, the, the telecom tower. And that led to a whole range of issues because once the diesel generator was there, local strongmen claimed kind of the, 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 the ownership over these generators and they, they tended to use the, 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 the subsidized diesel for these uh, generators to do anything but powering the telecom tower. And this became a big implementation challenge in, 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 in a number of states. So this was brought up in meetings in, in Bihar and in Chhattisgarh. And it may have been the result from the lack of coordination between these different uh, programs, uh, use of an, an RGDY in this particular case. So this was a bit of a digression just to kind of um, highlight what the value could be of studying these uh, different programs in conjunction at a relatively low administrative level. We also collect, uh, collect data on road construction. So the relevant program here is the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, uh, or, or PMGSY. Again, once you go through the effort of uh, mapping these programs at the, at the village level, you can, you can, you can visualize uh, the, the program rollout. And, and I do this here for the state of Shatisgar. Now, one thing to already note here, and this is a bit of a link to the second part of the talk, is that in the south of, of Shatisgar and the east of Shatisgar, which is heavily affected by mouse activity, as is the north of Shatisgar, you see that road completion, uh, or that the kind of provision of roads is very, very incomplete. So it's not as if these are places that were initially uh, already connected to the road network. So you see in gray here the existing road network. It's, it's if anything, less dense than, 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 than the rest of the state. Um, but this, is, this really points already to the fact that completion of these infrastructure projects in conflict zones could be a very, uh, a very real concern. Another program that we consider is the, the National Rural Drinking Water Program um, that provides uh, clean drinking water to, to habitations and is now targeting uh, those habitations that have less than 50 liters uh, per capita per day of, 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 of clean drinking water. Um, and we also consider in our project more flexible infrastructure programs. And one important example of that is IAP, the Integrated Action Plan, um, which is particularly targeted at districts that are suffering from left-wing extremism. But this, this program actually offers a very interesting counterfactual for the large flagship programs that uh, I've, I've talked about earlier. Because these are programs that for which are no exact selection criteria, nor, nor is there kind of a, any restriction on the type of infrastructure that you can build under them. In fact, the programs are, this, this IAP program is completely administered by the local district collector in a committee 
uh, that also um, in which the, the SV and the forest officer um, are also playing an important advisory role. So this is really a top-down project that we can respond to local infrastructure needs in a very flexible manner. And even though from a research design perspective, this is quite, quite challenging, because you can think of lots of endogeneity concerns in the rollout, it's still, a, like from, a, from a, a broader policy perspective, it's a very interesting counterfactual um, to, to study how different um, kind of uh, completion, pro, uh, completion metrics are for such a flexible program <coughs> when we compare it to the large scale uh, programs that, are, that do not have this, this flexibility to respond to local needs. So I will now just very briefly, because I realize that we're, we're running uh, relatively short on, on, on time, um, I will just very briefly introduce some of the preliminary analysis that we've done in trying to understand how infrastructure provision would be different in conflict affected uh, um, areas. And this map just shows you which districts of India are uh, affected by, by Maoist violence. And obviously, you can come up with, with very different metrics here. But the, the one we use here is that you, you, your, your highlighted in gray on this map if, you, if your district has had at least one Maoist-related casualty between 2005 and 2010. And so what you see is that this is a, it's a low-intensity conflict, so it's not that, that this is kind of an, an all-out civil war that affects one-third of the Indian, Indian territory, but at the same time it's true that more than one-sixth of, 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 of Indian districts are affected by Maoism in some sense or another. Now, for the Universal Service Obligation Fund, we can actually construct a number of measures that try to capture the efficiency of program completion. So we see that at the village level, uh, for which we have more than 500,000 observations, about 1% of villages were received the completed uh, use of tower. If we focus on the 7,200 uh, towers for which we were able to map them at the village level, we see that 13% of the proposed towers were actually cancelled in, uh, in the rollout process. And this is something we, we made, this is a process that we, 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 we obviously we try to understand. Then we can also look at the days of completion between the launch of the program and the construction of the tower. And what we can also look at is how far the actual tower is from the tower that has been proposed by the technical consultant and this is an interesting metric because the technical consultant was trying to optimize the coverage area of the tower. So ideally, this is where the tower should have been built, but for a variety of reasons, com the commercial providers who were being subsidized by the program may have tried to move the location. And on average, it actually turned out that the tower was about four kilometers farther, uh, about four kilometers away from the technically optimal location. And so this is another outcome <coughs> that we, we can look at. Now, the following graph just plots project completion um, as a, 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 a distribution function um, in the different, uh, in, in kind of di three different types of districts. So in the green line, I plot districts that are unaffected by mass yeah. activity. In the blue line, I plot um, districts that are severely affected, and the red line is somewhere in between. So these are districts that have violence below the median of those affected, of the, the total set of affected districts. And what you see in the graph is a relatively unexpected pattern. You actually see that program completion, or the days of completion, tend to be lower for severely affected districts. But then if you go up in the distribution, you see that overall completion is much less. And this is a, a, a pattern that you can also look at in a different way. So this graph just plots the probability of completion of a tower by the level of violence. And what we see is that at, at very low le levels of violence, there's no impact on, or there's no association, I should say, with uh, tower completion. But as violence becomes more severe, you see probabilities drop very, very starkly and in the most heavily affected districts, the probability of actually building a proposed tower is as low as 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously this becomes a, I mean, so this is a sense in which uh, the, the, 
the, the demand is conflict really becomes a, a, a development uh, constraint. But if we then look at within the set of completed towers, if we look at the days to completion, we see an interesting pattern, or we see the pattern confirmed that we, we hinted at earlier, which is that at least initially, it seems that in districts affected by Maoist violence, the days, the days it takes to complete the telecom tower are decreasing. So in affected districts, we have lower completion times, and they only start to rise as we move up along the, the, the distribution. Um, I, will, I will skip the tables, but so I, I will just say that these patterns turn out to be uh, statistically significant. For PMGSY, we're a bit constrained in the analysis because one thing we cannot do yet there is look at uh, completion rates. But if we look at the set of completed PMGSY roads in Chhattisgarh, what we see is that for roads, actually severely affected areas have longer completion times. So for towers, we seem to have lower completion times in conflict zones. For roads, we seem to have higher completion times. And this is a pattern that's, 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 uh, that, that's perhaps uh, different from what we would have expected, I, I agree. <coughs> but when we started to talk to policymakers, we actually got some suggestions of why these uh, completion patterns could be, could be different. And, and one issue what that was pointed out was that for, uh, for the, the, the Maoist movement to be opposing road construction is politically not very attractive. So they don't want to be perceived as, as by, 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 by the villagers as blocking these types of development. At the same time, they also want to prevent security forces from being able to move around very efficiently. So what they told us was that uh, the typical strategy of, the, of, of Maui's rebels was to actually allow the construction to, to start, but then start to disrupt it, possibly also extort from the road contractors, and start try to uh, kind of prevent in particular the construction of culverts, which would make the roads very vulnerable to the, to the monsoon rains, and which would also effectively block uh, security force movements, while at the same time not being perceived as the key kind of hindrance to, uh, to economic development. The case of telecom towers is really different. Telecom towers are really like heavily opposed by the Maoist movement, and, and, and from talking to, to police officers, there are two big reasons for that. The first one is that uh, as soon as, as, as telecom coverage be reaches a village, it becomes very easy for villagers to share information on the movement of the Maoists uh, to, with, with the police. And this is something that the, the Maoists want to prevent like at, at, at all costs. At the same time, the, 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 the police also has wiretapping operations, and these towers and apparently the, the, the Maoist movement finds it very hard to discipline its skaters into not using mobile phones. And so again, if these towers are in place, it becomes very hard for them to kind of prevent information of their movements to uh, reach the police. And so this could explain why we see very, very kind of like, especially in the heavily affected districts, we see very kind of very uh, uh, low tower completion which is probably a result from threats made to the commercial providers who were subsidized under this scheme that these towers would be blown up if ever they would, they, they would, be, they would be built. And um, th th there are, of course, multiple instances in the, in, in the news of towers being blown up by, by, by Maui's rebels. At the same time, tower completion, so towers in, 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 in contrast to roads, do not take very long to complete. So, the, the completion process here, if we think of hundreds of days, most of these are administrative procedures of, of finding the, the, the lo a location on which the, the, the provider, the commercial provider, can acquire the land for the tower. But it's not that the actual construction takes hundreds of days. The actual construction, in fact, can take as little as a, as, a, as a week. And so what we see there is that this process of land acquisition is actually relatively harder in the more developed places that do not, that tend to be not affected by Maoist activity. <coughs> and the drivers of kind of project completion in, in, the, in, the, in, in the, 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 the telecom uh, uh, tower construction uh, program, they turn out to be very different than the drivers of completion uh, in, in uh, road construction. So all of these results are very preliminary and that is because we're uh, still like we're still collecting 
uh, some of the data on these infrastructure programs, and I think in terms of where we are in the, in the <coughs> project, our research project, is that we've almost finished the data collection, and we're now moving on to f uh, kind of full-time data cleaning, which is uh, particularly challenging, and, and, and perhaps uh, we can get at that during the, the policy discussion later, because even though these programs are kind of monitored and, and, and documented at the village level, the, it is very rare that these that the, uh, monitoring information systems actually use the, the census village level, uh, the census village codes, which means that to match these villages to census villages, you need to rely on, ba on, 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 on name based matching, which can be very painful because names of Indian villages are not uh, are they, they, they are not easy, not always easily comparable uh, if you compare these different uh, infrastructure. Uh, so this is an effort that will that will take uh, that will take up a few more months. And I think once we once we'll be past uh, the data cleaning effort, we can go back to some of these initial research questions and tell a more precise picture about what project completion looks like in mouse affected areas, and then also get at the impacts of these programs. But just as a conclusion, let me just say that I think India's flagship rural infrastructure development projects. Um, can be hugely interesting for researchers to understand the socioeconomic impacts of rural infrastructure development, as well as understanding the implementation process. I also want to highlight here that um, what's interesting as well is that there was a very kind of visible lack of coordination between different types of infrastructure. And then in the context of India's left-wing extremist uh, affected districts, I just provided some preliminary evidence that um, seem to confirm the idea that there are particular in, uh, implementation challenges in conflict zones. And from the preliminary results, uh, we, we got a suggestion that these patterns could depend on the type of infrastructure, but that also there could be nonlinearities in the relationship between completion measures and measures of uh, observable uh, violence. And um, I think this is where I, I, will, I, I realize that I may already have no, thank you very much. Actually, uh, you said you've gone a bit over time, but uh, you're presenting a very fascinating uh, study. Of course, it's a work in progress, as you yourself said, so we'd be quite interested in seeing what happens uh, to the analysis when it's all done. You know, I'm going to slightly alter the sequence of speakers uh, with everyone's consent. Uh, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Ashish Bachani, who's the director uh, who deals with these issues in the Ministry of Finance, and he told me that what he'd like to do is lay out what the new government's approach is. So I thought it would be useful to have him speak first. That will enable the other panelists uh, to moderate their remarks or modify their remarks or comment on the new, uh, new, new approach. So the next speaker is Ashish Bachani. And then uh, I'm going to, I propose that we, well, then uh, Dr. Ratin Roy is listed, and then Professor Gill is listed. Uh, Dr. Professor Ende, I thought, uh, rather than have you in the middle, you might want to comment at the end, because you're, you're, you're there in the panel also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this way, in case any of them um, make remarks about the presentation you've made, you can then comment on that, and then we'll open it up to discussion. So if this is okay, uh, Ashish, why don't you go ahead? With the permission of the chair, uh, thank you, IGC, for this opportunity as a practitioner and part of the policy making and implementing uh, body in India. I think uh, this opportunity gives, uh, gives me uh, something to learn and something to share about the new government. As the chair and Oliver, uh, my compliments for a very insightful presentation. Uh, I would like to use the time that I have been allocated in two parts. In the first, I would uh, very briefly try and share with you the economic prospects and uh, development priorities of the new government that has assumed office about a little over 100 days ago. In the second part, I'll briefly summarize the regulatory issues that the government of India is facing 
particularly with the infrastructure sector. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you would possibly agree that there is a renewed optimism about India's growth story. Various analysts call it very fascinating. And this optimism stems from the fact that while India is closely integrated in the global economy and faces the risks and the vagaries that afflict most countries in the world, our economic fundamentals still remain strong. I would uh, like you to consider the reasons why I am saying this. Uh, the first is that uh, India's population is very young. According to a very recent study of the IMF, uh, I think it was in 2013, uh, the demographic dividend that India has could add up to 2% to its GDP over the next 20 years. The second reason is that India has been focusing on building a world-class infrastructure. According to the 12th uh, five-year plan, uh, we require an investment of nearly 1.1 trillion US dollars and nearly 50% of this has to come from the private sector. The 12th plan period would span 2012 to 2017. Now this policy thrust on infrastructure development has important spin-offs in terms of higher investments in the manufacturing sector. Then we look at greater employment generation in this sector. Uh, today in fact uh, the Prime Minister of India had been launching the Make in India project. Now, to exemplify what I have been stating, uh, Oliver spoke about the Bharat Nirman program of the uh, previous government. Uh, we have now, in fact, uh, it's a continuing program, the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, for instance, which is uh, pegged at about 90, 90 billion US dollars. We have similar industrial corridor and freight corridor projects coming up between Amritsar and Calcutta. Uh, there is one coming up between Chennai and Bangalore. There's another coming up between Bangalore and Mumbai. Now, this kind of an investment, we believe, would create uh, an environment that would spur investments into the manufacturing sector. Uh, the third important reason why I say that the economic prospects of India seem to be very bright is that the government of India has launched a very ambitious skill development pro program, and the objective is to equip our populace with the requisite skills for the emerging markets that are uh, expected to take uh, roots within the country. Fourth, India's final household consumption has been very healthy. In fact, in the recent year, the rural demand has been adding to the healthy urban middle class consumption demand growth. And this has buffered India somewhat to the vagaries of demand in the global economy. This, we believe, should stand India in a good stead. And finally, Policy regimes and governance in India continues to remain predictable. There is a broad consensus amongst political spectrum, amongst all the parties in the political spectrum, on what is meant by growth. Growth is interpreted as inclusive. It means that it has to be broad-based. It means that it has to be shared and one that has a human face. The new government, as I mentioned, is little over 100 days old. In its maiden budget that was presented uh, uh, recently, for the 2014-2015 financial year, the government has outlined a very uh, elaborate vision on putting India on a high and sustained growth trajectory. Now, this, the, the core objective that has been outlined by the finance minister is that we would target achieving 8% GDP growth rate over the period of next four, three to four years. Now, this has to be achieved through four important measures. The first being enhancing domestic and foreign investments in the infrastructure and manufacturing sector. The second is creation of an investor-friendly environment. Third is fostering social inclusion. And fourth, and possibly an equally important uh, component, is fiscal consolidation. The budget incorporates slew of measures aimed at accelerating growth, particularly in the manufacturing. And we firmly believe that bulk of the project delivery has to come in the PPP mode about which the NIPFP director would be speaking shortly. With the economic and fiscal reforms already in place, including those on the anvil, we expect that India's growth would be sustained and uh, robust in the uh, immediate future. I, I would leave further questions on this subject for any discussion that may follow. I would briefly summarize the regulatory issues that we face vis-a-vis -vis the infrastructure sector in India. You would agree when I say that regulation of a sector implies a certain degree of external control and direction. Usually it is rooted in law. The objective is to promote public interest, 
and it seeks to ensure that there is no windfall profiteering, uh, there is uh, universal provision of service, uh, you set sector standards in service delivery, we, have, we do not have self-destructive price competitions, we take care of the consumers, the environment, the employees and the like. An equally important component of regulation is the planning and sequencing of regulations. If you look across the world, you would find that planning and sequencing of regulation differs from country to country. In India, it has been fundamentally different. Throughout most of the 20th century, the infrastructure services have been provided by the government because government thought infrastructure provision is a natural monopoly and only government is competent in protecting the national, uh, that is the public interest. Uh, this, however, created situations of operational inefficiencies, decline in service quality, inadequate public investments, and neglect of consumer interests. Then there was a radical change in the early 1990s, the time of the economic reforms, where fiscal constraints, the need to attract new investments, and ensuring proper quality provisioning of infrastructure, there was a complete departure from the way we had been viewing infrastructure provisioning earlier. The telecom sector was the first to open up in 1991. This was followed by the ports in 1996, followed by roads in 1997 and the others. However, it is important to note that regulation in these sectors did not begin at the same time the sectors were opened up. In fact, you would be uh, interested in knowing that the first regulatory setup came about in the electricity sector and it was not in the government of India but in a province of Orissa. Government of India followed a little later. The TRI, which is now the Telecom Authority, uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which is considered to be one of the best regulators across the world, is, uh, was set up in 1997, while the telecom sector was opened up in 1991. The Central Electricity Regulatory Authority, again, a commission, again, a very professional body, came up in 1998. We have the Tariff Authority for major ports, stamps, for the port sector came up much later in 1997. Now, over the last decade, there is a growing uh, consensus within government that uh, regulatory institutions do play an important role in managing the sector, a professional management of sector, and we are looking forward to uh, regulatory institutions in, in, in bodies such as the railways, um, uh, such as uh, your highways, and real estate sector. Uh, we are optimistic that we should be having some kind of a policy consensus on this as we approach uh, the uh, next financial year. Uh, with these broad views, I would like to sum up and I thank you for this opportunity to share with you the objectives, the development priorities, objectives of the Government of India. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Ashish. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Ratin Roy. Uh, so, Ratin, would you like to? Yes, uh, good afternoon. I, if I may, I'll speak from you here. Can Thank you. Is this audible? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you for IGC for having me here. Uh, <clears throat> after going through your slides, I, I said to the organizers, I don't think I should be here because this is not a subject I'm fit to comment on. I never have thought about these very interesting things. I have speculative ideas. And they said, that's all right. We want you to talk about infrastructure finance. So other than complimenting you on what I think is a very interesting body of work and perhaps later over a coffee suggesting to you why completion rates on telecom towers in, in Maoist areas will be higher. Uh, I shall not uh, touch on it upon your presentation. I will talk about the infrastructure finance problem. Uh, as, as Mr. Bachani said, uh, it is today the perception of the government of India and the perception of many that the uh, binding constraint to strong and sustainable growth and therefore human development in India is ramshackle, inadequate, infrastructure. And there are many things you can do about ramshackle and inadequate without money, but if you don't have enough infrastructure and what you have is bad, you do need to worry about how you mobilize the finance. There I just want to point out that I think we face three layers of challenges. The first layer has to do with the poor productivity of investment in India more generally and the difficulty I have as a macroeconomist in relating productivity to growth. This is meant to be provocative for discussion. Uh, investment GDP ratios in India have hovered around 30% over the last seven or eight years, and this seems to not vary 
whether the growth rate is five or nine. So I don't exactly know what our capital output ratio is in a stable sense. Six is terrible as it is today. Uh, you know, three is pretty good. Uh, and this is something that we develop, me, but uh, I suspect the answer lies in the rather complicated production functions that have emerged in India as a consequence of infrastructure bottlenecks. Let me give you an example. Because of, because of highly interrupted power supply, electricity supply in my city, in Delhi, uh, I have to maintain in my institute the following. 100% power backup in the form of two generators, which operate on average at 6% capacity utilization. Uh, humongous power backup for my servers, which do a lot of big data crunching. And redundancy in the, in the, in the IT equipment, which means very low capacity utilization, and so on and so forth. So the, the response to ramshackle and poor quality public infrastructure has been the development of stopgap solutions, which collectively provide us with fairly low capacity utilization. This is, this is a problem which, which therefore is structural to all of the economy, not just infrastructure, uh, and goes away if we know at which end to attack it in terms of what infrastructure to provide, how soon and when. The second problem is the mosaic of infrastructure financing in India. As Mr. Bachani said, we need $1.1 trillion over the next five years. Uh, the government of India's contribution to that is reducing, not the contribution to the state governments, but the contribution to the state governments to infrastructure is going more into areas like irrigation. It's not going into infrastructure, electricity, ports, etc. As you yourself said, I think uh, the latest figures are that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one third, effectively one third of the total financing requirement that would come from a highly fiscally constrained central government. Half the financing, therefore, will come from, uh, well, from commercial banks, the remainder from non-bank financial in intermediaries, and, and a relatively small amount at this stage is envisaged to come from equity and FDI. So in short, I mean, even if I'm, if I'm off the mark by 10%, uh, it remains the case that our commercial banking system will have to bear the brunt of providing infrastructure finance. And here lies the problem. India's savings GDP ratio is about close on 30% on a good day. Half of, 23% uh, of that is household saving. More than half of household saving, and this is an increasing trend, never sees a bank. It's called physical saving. The upshot is it never sees a bank. It doesn't mean it does not add to productivity. It is not invested, but it is highly unlikely that that money is, in in, is invested in infrastructure. So what you're left with the banking system is about half of household saving, and a large chunk of that is preempted by the public, by, by, by the government, uh, to finance its fiscal deficit, which is largely consumption expenditure, the central government. Almost four-fifths of it is consumption expenditure. Add to that the problem that we have to restructure the balance sheets of Indian banks very soon and the price ticket will not be low. Then this present strategy on, of relying on bank finance to generate infrastructure is going to be difficult to sustain. If that is the case, then we have to perhaps rely far more on FDI and foreign equity investment than we thought if we are going to meet this one trillion gap, even in substantial measure. There, I think there are two constraints. One is, uh, and I would slightly disagree with Ashish here, the, the, the perception, which is what matters, that Indian regulatory frameworks are capricious, uh, corrupt, and ill-suited to purpose. And capricious is particularly important. It doesn't help that the business of caprice of framing rules, dismantling them, altering them, fiddling with them, tinkering with them has become part of the business process of budgets of the central bank and of government post generally. It continues to be a vociferous business process of the government of India. The new prime minister has promised, uh, I think, minimum government, maximum governance, but I'm yet to see how that will be spelt out. The, the daily notifications of the finance ministry continue at this. Uh, I don't see any, any systematic attempt to reduce caprice in the business process of government, and that is, something that adds on to a burden which is already stacked against India and other developing countries. The biggest problem in, in getting, so this is, this is, I would say, 
you know, legitimate perception bias, but there are solutions that are endogenous to us. But even if we were to, 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 to secure these solutions, there is I th what I would term illegitimate perception bias. Number one, uh, the financial system globally is biased against providing long-term finance. It is particularly biased against providing long-term finance for emerging economies. In short, however good my project proposal for a port or any infrastructure project in India, and however good the track record of an Indian company or joint venture, the default rating an infrastructure project gets is your country risk rating. So it's very difficult for, for, a, for, a, for a, at, the, at the project level to transcend your country risk rating. Now you may argue the solution therefore is to improve your country risk rating. But uh, I would say that if, if, if I wish to you know, create a leading edge within a country, which may have a country risk rating limited by a number of factors, also perception as being lower than I think it ought to be, then uh, this biases against uh, bringing finance in. That is the first problem. The second problem is a structural one that's bedeviling everybody. In the last 10 years, the share of the developing world in global saving has been rising very sharply and today exceeds the share of the developed world as in terms of total savings by annually. And if you take out China even, it's only slightly below. That is not the case yet with the share of investment of the developing world. In short, developing country savings are being invested in the developed world. And this is, if you like, the other mega structural problem we have. So the prospects of securing non-trivial changes in this international scenario on the understanding that we will also endeavor, I hope, to secure the non-trivial changes in our domestic scenario are daunting. There are fora like the G20, where attempts are being made to see how this can be done. There are attempts being made to talk about reforming international financial architecture at the Bretton Woods level. These are very slow. Uh, and therefore, again, the stark choice before us is that, you know, we could, best in the world, improve the quality of what we can do to secure large infrastructure finance, given that there are limits to the current pattern we have. But the ultimate solution will lie in getting non-trivial amounts of increased FDI. And the only way we seem to be able to do it is by getting bilateral commitments, which we are doing, I think, very effectively from other Asian countries, including China. And uh, that is the rather difficult logic, in my view, of infrastructure finance where India stands at the moment. There are solutions, but they're not going to be easy ones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I'm going to request the next speaker, Professor Gill, yeah. to make his presentation. <coughs> So uh, I'm, a, I'm a professor of infrastructure development at the Manchester Business School, and uh, the research I'm going to present actually is uh, uh, being undertaken uh, jointly with my research student, uh, Rihanna Musulo, that she's uh, over there. Um, I thank the, the panel and the organizers for inviting us to present the research. It's, uh, it was one of those days that felt we were just checking our email and then received this invitation. It was quite interesting, no? Um, so we come from a background that we are interested in the uh, development of a large infrastructure. And uh, interesting, we've, for many years we have been looking into development of infrastructure in developed countries, no? But at some point we thought, well, I think we should, the world is very big, countries are very different, societies are very different, so why don't we start looking to large infrastructure developments in developing countries? And we come from a, a, a theoretical background where we are always interested in trying to connect 
the structures of the ecosystems in which these infrastructures take place to how well the projects perform. So we, always are, we are always interested in, in uncovering new linkages between structure, and by structure we mean the way in which the, the, the projects are organized, the structure of the projects, the way in which the rights to make decisions are shared across different organizations that come together, and the way in which the projects are governed who ultimately has the power to make decisions, the extent to which that power to make decisions is distributed or, con or centralized, and then connect that to outcomes, to performance. So that's uh, the type of research that we do, and ultimately try to uncover new recipes to get better outcomes, and probably by changing the structures, no? So that in this case we are, but then, when we think about outcomes, the question then becomes what, what we mean by outcomes, and in particular by performance, no? So we kind of, how do we measure performance? How do we evaluate performance? So when I was putting together the slides for this talk, I thought, well, I think that's, let me, that's ultimately what, what I like to, to try to transmit through this presentation, is that probably what we mean by performance in the context of India in large infrastructure development in India is not necessarily the same that what we would, have, we would mean by performance in a different context. Now, before I, I get into the, the presentation, I thought, well, it might be useful, and I think I was in, uh, I thought very interesting about your, your, your overview of the world of finance, that to think that this is a global, we are increasingly moving into a global world very interconnected, now, and the financing of infrastructure is one of those uh, phenomena that is really, that is taking place in an increasingly uh, global and, and interconnected world. And this is going to be challenging for a country like India in particular because you are competing on the global stage with other countries. Every country is trying to entice the capitalists, the, the, the <coughs> organizations that own the, that own the capital, like the international lenders, the banks, the sovereign wealth funds, the infrastructure funds, that come to us, invest in our country, as opposed to invest in their country. Now, so India is competing directly with the UK. So why should, if I'm a capitalist and I have capital to invest, why should I invest in India as opposed to invest in the UK, for example? Why should I invest in India in a dedicated freight corridor if I can invest in the high speed tool or in the Thames link in this country or in Crossrail or in other projects? So you have to put deals on the market that will be in a way superior to the deals that other countries are trying to, to put together. And this is a, a dynamic process in the sense that once you put one deal, other countries will try to do, construct a deal and immediately will respond by trying to put together an even more attractive deal. So it's becoming very, very challenging this business, no? Then the other thing that, so countries compete with institutions, of course developing countries in that regard have uh, a weak spot there because people are, are going to argue, well, invest in the UK, invest in France, these guys are very robust institutions, very solid legal systems, so you kind of have to overcome that, uh, perhaps offering more profit because ultimately capitalists want to make money out, out of this process. Uh, and then, of course, we also have the, 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 the guys in that bubble in red, which is this global supply chain. These are lobbyists, no? So you have companies like Bechtel, CH2ME, they are all over the world trying to lobby governments to, to invest. And if you invest, then we can sell our capabilities. Now, that's what these companies do, because you can't, these companies don't make money unless governments create opportunities for them to sell their technical and managerial capabilities. So these companies are all over the world trying to persuade governments to invest and, and spotting investment opportunities so they can sell services. But again, what these companies want at the end of the day is to make profit. So you have the guys in red that want to make the global suppliers that want to make profit, you have the capitalists that want to make profit, and you have countries that have socioeconomic interests in, and therefore need to create opportunities for the others to make profit, no? In the middle of this, you have countries trying to devise <coughs> new business systems through which you can try to bring the different uh, uh, elements of the world together, and critically, you have these other guys, the rating agencies, that are not accountable to anyone. Big issue in the world, no? They realize they are, the, uh, they are policing the system, 
but they don't respond to anyone. And we've seen what happened with the financial crisis. So basically, but at the same time, you can't ignore them because they are the ones that are saying, well, an investment in, in India is just AAD or ADD, whereas an investment in the UK is going, in the infrastructure bond is going to be AAA. So then if India, because it's a weaker investment, so you have to increase your, the, the amount of uh, the profitability of the, of, your, of the investment that you are going to put on the market. So big issue with the rating agencies, no? Because they are not accountable. And actually there's an interesting study from Harvard published last week that said, that showed that the, le the more, how it was, so the fact that they're operating, the more competitive the markets in which they operate to sell their services, not necessarily their performance improves in terms of the reliability of the of the, the classifications that they give to the investments. They don't, they, they don't even <coughs> are under the market pressure to perform well, so they, which is a big, big issue. But at the same time, you can't ignore them. Now, the other thing is that infrastructure happens to what we, this thing that we call mega projects, you know? So, and this is also a, another source of complexity in this environment. Now, what are these mega projects to which infrastructure happens, no? Whether it is a program that brings together many small programs like the rural infrastructure or something very big, very large, like the one that I'm going to talk next, the dedicated freight corridor. Basically, these are, these are networks, very vast networks, no? Because governments cannot, don't, they don't have in-house capability to deliver large infrastructure schemes. So they need to bring, they need to create partnerships with the private sector. But then governments themselves are very complex. So you need, you have different public agencies that ultimately also need to get involved into the delivery of these large infrastructure schemes. So you basically, whenever you want to change the built environment through an infrastructure program to accomplish perhaps some social ob objectives like uh, modernize education, improve health care, and you start by perhaps in modernizing the built environment, you are, cre governments are creating networks and unify that the of uh, legally independent organizations that are unified under the vote because everyone agrees that it's the right thing to do or because it's, it's going to create profitability opportunities for me. So I'm, I want to build this Olympic Park, I want to build this, this bridge, I want to build this, this uh, railway system. No? So to the other thing with infrastructure is that so, that, so ultimately this project is creating infrastructure which is a, an artificial resource that then many people are going to share in use. Now this is not, we are not talking about mobile phones, which is your mobile phone and each one of us has one and, we, and the way we, we use it is just up to me, myself, the owner, no? These are, if you build a, a railway infrastructure or a dam or, or an Olympic park, many people will want to influence the scope of the program because they are ultimately going to share it in use. So it, these are assets that are being created to be shared by many, which creates lots of complications. Now, if we think about the empirical irregularities about uh, large infrastructure developments, what we know is that they tend to run late. They often, or more often than not, they are not delivered within the bu budget, the initial budget, no? So there's always this substantial slippage in performance expectations. So they are announced, these people release some performance expectations, and then over the, as the program unfolds, we realize that things are slipping. No? And this is from one project in the UK, that uh, one is the final outcome, and so if I, I cannot disclose the project, it's confidential, it's commercial, it's, uh, it's commercial, it's confidential, but it started uh, at in zero now with a, with a 0 0.7, it's basically Now, so this is kind of, this does not surprise us. Now, we, we know that this is the story. No? What is interesting is that India is no different. No? That's what data was from the UK, and India is no different. And this is where I'm now introducing the case of the Golden Quadrilateral. No? This is a massive scheme. No? If, we go, if we think about what uh, Europe and the, the US did with uh, the big highway programs and railway programs in the, in the 19th century and the 20th century, no? India is is trying to do that now, and they have been very relatively successful with the highway scheme, and uh, less so, I would argue, with the railway scheme, or perhaps not less so. It might just be, again, what we mean by performance, no? But basically, the story is that, that on, the, on the right, we have uh, the existing railway network, which for, it has 
hasn't changed much in the last 100 years, <coughs> and it's highly <coughs> congested. No? As a result of that, that, it has created a number of problems because they have been losing a flight, the, the share of the market in regards to, to flight transport to the roads. No? Now, this creates lots of problems for them. One is because the tariffs with freight are significantly higher, and it's through the tariffs that they get from these high tariffs that, and the high revenues that they get from freight transport, they can, they, they can subsidize the very low tariffs uh, for passenger transport, and those you can't increase them because that, those are very politically sensitive, so uh, the politicians are not going from one day to the other to start uh, dramatically raising the passenger tariffs, so the only where they have room for maneuver is in a railway is basically to increase the, the what they charge freight for freight transport, no? Now, as freight, but because they are not providing a good service in the sense that it takes a lot of time to deliver goods, uh, to transport the freight, uh, from one, to move the goods from one city to another, from the port to the cities, the people are moving to the roads. Well, as a result of that, the roads are becoming e even more congested, it uh, creates problems that you need to import more fuel, it's really it's going to pollute more the, the environment. So it's one of those projects that uh, everyone agrees that we need to do something. And what we need to do something, so this was in the works since the 2000, but uh, it's like, okay, we need to create a, a dedicated freight corridor network. Now, this makes a lot of sense. In the, for example, the UK is trying to create a, a dedicated passenger uh, 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 railway network, high speed two. They, they, they go for a freight one. And it makes a lot of sense, and they call it the Golden Quadrilateral. So you have kind of an, uh, some corridors in the periphery, and then uh, two long corridors that make the diagonal. So basically, it's six corridors, no? Lots of sense, and then people say, well, this is it's urgent. Now we have all this. <coughs> our transport infrastructure is not working as a result of that that is becoming an impediment to social economic development of the country, no? You cannot create new cities, you cannot attract manufacturing, you cannot divers diversify the economy. We need it yesterday, no? So people have been saying that since uh, the late 90s. Uh, and then they decided, okay, uh, as a priority, we uh, let's try to, to do the first two corridors, no? And the... the the, the, the goal is even goes beyond just the pure dedicated freight corridor. It's really part of the narrative of uh, diversifying the economy away from agrarian activities into creating a manufacturing hub. No, because once you have the corridors, you can start attracting more manufacturers uh, that will be attracted also by the cheap, qualified labor, and suddenly you you can have um, you can along the corridors and some. You mentioned the uh, Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor, and there's another industrial corridor. So this is almost like uh, copying the, the industrial corridors in Japan, that for, that for example, the one that connects Tokyo to Osaka. Now you can see the whole narrative, and it's one of those that is consensual. So it's almost a super ordinary goal. It's planning. Everyone thinks that this is, needs to happen, and it should have happened already yesterday. No? Now, so given there was this consensus, and after one first study that the government uh, commissioned to rights, which is this, uh, uh, this agency under the, the Indian Railways, so they, they end up releasing a first set of performance expectations in 2006. Big mistake. And the performance, mistake, the performance ex expectations that were publicly announced were, well, okay, we are going for two first corridors. You can see that uh, the one on the eastern corridor, the, the one on the right, And uh, they released a budget, 22,000 crores, and uh, uh, an expected completion date. This is going to be, be open by 2012, no? And, uh, and they, they released the routes, which were going mainly along the original alignment, so in order to attenuate problems of land acquisition, given that a lot of the land was already under the ownership of the Indian Railways. So they kind of released also the, the routes. And it's again, because that area is on the, on the right, is very rich in minerals. This would also uh, amplify the feasibility of the narrative in the sense that if we are going to create, a, attract more manufacturing on the western side, we need, more, we need to 
bring more coal, we need more minerals that are very rich, so we can enable to transport the natural resources from the right to the left. So you could see the whole thing, uh, it really makes a lot of sense. Now, let's go back eight years later. Where are we regarding the, the corridor and the golden spatula also more generally? The requirements have changed quite a lot. And it goes back to finances. Now, once we start saying, scratching your head, your head and thinking, well, I'm going to pay for this stuff, then one, of, one uh, viable uh, option was, okay, let's uh, get Japan to write a check. Well, Japan comes into the equation and starts saying, well, by the way, I don't like a lot of things in your scheme, so I want to change it. I, want it to, I don't like the fact that you are thinking to, to run a diesel locomotive. It needs to be electrified, so you change. I think you, I also don't like the, the requirements that you have for the railway track. You have to change. And I, don't, I also think I don't like the alignment. You have to change. I don't like this and that and that. And then suddenly you end up with a different scope. Then you have the politicians. I think we need to extend the line to Calcutta, to the port. Some people say, well, but the port is not a big water port. It doesn't make financial uh, sense to extend. Well, <coughs> political is not acceptable. You have to extend. <coughs> So you kind of said, you can see the, the environment starting in. Now, the, the core idea is that if you, if you close the core too much, that, closes, that controls the strategy, it's not going to happen. If you start pushing back all this pressure to change your scheme, it's not going to happen. Now, Japan is not going to write a check if you, are, if you, keep, you keep pushing back. So you have to start negotiating a, a new scope that is going to accumulate the needs of very of legally independent parties, all of which uh, operate in the ecosystem, no? So, the scope changed dramatically, the processes changed dramatically. You will knock on the door of the World Bank and say, can you, can you borrow some money? Uh, or will you lend us some money to, to do this? And the World Bank says, yes, fine, but by the way, I don't like the way you are acquiring the land. I don't like the fact that you can acquire uh, land without doing uh, an environmental assessment as we do in the developed countries. And suddenly you have all these international lenders saying, fine, I write the check, but you have to adopt the standards that we, have, we adopt now, not the ones that we adopt 150 years ago when we were in de developing countries, no? Big impediment to progress, because these are very stringent standards that we would take it for granted in the UK, but suddenly to make to imprint them in a developing country is going to become a, 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 a big obstacle to, to progress. But, well, if you don't do it, I'm not going to, you are not going to get the money. So, but part, so what we have today then, most of the land has been acquired, which is fantastic news in India. Finance is not yet totally resolved. It's resolved for the, the, the main corridor. But this part from here to there, they want to do it through PPP. And, uh, if we go back to the first slide, there's lots of PPPs in the, in, on the market. We are competing uh, with lots of other interesting projects for that one. It's not going to be easy, definitely, to get a, or you are going to have to be extremely generous with what you want the private sector. The budget continues to go up. It goes up and down. It, at some point this year, it was 95,000 crore. Then uh, Geron said there was not enough money to do that. Now they set the contingency. It's going to 80,000. So basically, it's going to cost whatever it needs to cost. It's the figure I, it's not so, I wouldn't give it any credit, no? Uh, Staggered opening, climate. So one thing that they've done that is right, and I'll do exactly the same, is that stop saying that it's going to open on 1,000 crores. You can't say that in this type of project. What you say is that, especially when you have the flexibility to say that it's going to start operating at a certain point in time, even if you just start operating in some segments, that's what you do. You, you create this soft landing. That's what we do also here to deal with the press. Because they, these, these things don't open from one day to the other. So now, actually, they move in a, more, in a way more intelligent way to something like, it's going to, we think it's, we put our plan is to start open operating, start of it by 2017. And you don't commit with anything else. Because you know, I can always meet, open some segments of the railway. And then you will see what happens to the other one. And in that way, I, it's, there, it's not embarrassing to start moving dates, no? Uh, procurement of the rolling stock, if you go to the Japan, uh, JICA's website, it's already planned that it's not going to have the, to, be, to be completed before 2024. Uh, and then you, you can look, you wonder, well, if you continue like that, if nothing changes, it will take at least 120, 220 to get to, to deliver the totality of the project. Yesterday, it's a big issue, isn't it? 
So, what's going on here? Democracy. The issue now is, we are not, we do not make study about China. We do not even make study about Oman or Dubai, these uh, autocratic monarchies. We do not make study in a democracy, in the largest democracy of the world. It's going to be difficult. It can only be difficult. It's a struggle. No? Ownership. in a world that in all the global space where you are competing with other countries that are also trying to entice exactly the same capitalists with, and who are under being monitored by these rating agencies. You have uh, tech, you have uh, other actor, actors own technical and managerial capabilities, not likely that the government owns that capability. You also have to buy this capability and you have hope with also to, to develop some internal capability make sure that the operators also participate in the process of developing the infrastructure. All these capabilities, all these resources without which schemes cannot happen are distributed in a democracy. So what we have in democracies, and that's why democracies these days are really struggling, and I, I'll include India, I'll include the UK, I'll include the US, the big issues in the US with infrastructure, with uh, uh, modernizing their infrastructure. We have collective action programs in democracy about trying to get this infrastructure. Because at the core that controls the strategy of this mega development, we have a co coalitions. These are not controlled by unitary actors. We have groups of actors that are coming together and will have shared control, strategic control of what's going to happen. Political coalitions, no? And more complicated than that, what we have is that the power the, the bargaining power of the coalition is going to fluctuate over time, and you may end up having compromise to make compromises that initially you never thought it was going to have to happen. It's going to have to happen, no? So the membership of the core structure that controls the strategy and the bargaining power is going to evolve. So you may appoint an agent, and uh, India did it just using very much the same governing structure that we use in the UK. It's a US uh, public agency called the uh, Corporation of India, which is there, but in these agencies report to different principles. Now they, they report to Japan because the Japan is writing a check. You have to respond to the World Bank because the World Bank is writing a check. You have to respond to the Ministry of Railways. You have the pressure from the Planning Commission. And you can't just shut the door and say, go to hell. I'll, I'm going to do what I want. It's not the way it works. That you have all these principles interfering with the strategy of your, of your company. No? Now, the easiest part, Marx arguably, is really managing the supply chain. The problem is to get to the point where you know exactly what you want, so you can invite those people that are waiting on your door to tell me what I need to do, because projects create opportunities for my company to make money. Okay, but you can't start, oh, you, and you will not be allowed to start until they know what they want. These guys are just waiting outside at the periphery because they cannot enter the projects and like these ones where you can just elbow in and say start changing things <coughs> in the project. They can't do that, the supply chain. They will lobby for them, hey guys, can you make your act get your act together? But you can't really in enter into the project. You have to be selected through competitive processes, no? Once that simulate bureaucracy. And once you are selected, then they can deliver. And of course if you ch if they change that is going to affect my profitability, I want to have compensation. And
and that and uh, rightly so. So what are the implications with this? So we have a lot of bargains and compromises within the card. A card with membership with in the cushion, then an arrival, a very late arrival of the periphery of all the supply chain, the contractors and the, and the engineers and the builders. As a result of that, when we start the scheme, what we, are really, what we know for sure is the scope is going to change. If there's no uncertainty in the process, is that it's not things are going to change. That's the only certainty. As a re because things are going to change, performance expectations are going to deviate from the original cargo. There's no, so I don't have any problem with that. The fact that you cannot deliver by the 26,000 crores initially, you, you don't want to care. What we, in the ideal world, that number would have always been kept private. The fact that you release it creates problems for the managers, but you, you, the performance expectations always deviate. Now, the other thing is mega projects that are going to be, according to what you want to say, you end up using, <coughs> statistically choosing, and humans are very good at manipulating the environment to try to achieve their goals, you end up choosing the baseline that is more convenient to, uh, to, to build the argument that you want to buy, to build. So if you want to say that the, the, the project is being mismanaged, mismanaged, you end up strategically choosing the first performance expectation that was released to, to 22,000 crores. If you want to say that the process is being very well managed, you are going to pick the performance expectation that was released two years ago, again, to check that the, pro the project is doing very well. We see the same thing happening in this country with the Olympics. Some people that want to denigrate the London 2012 will, will go, will pick the, the first performance number expectation, which was a cost around 2 billion. Other people that say we are, we are the best managers in the world will pick the 2007 number that was released in, a, in a 2007 when it, they said it's going to cost 9 billion. It's the same, no? So basically, and the other thing is that in this process, in this very complicated uh, collective action problem that happens in the democracy, there will always be winners and losers. And according to whether, so some people will end up being happy, other people will really be frustrated. They will feel disenfranchised, disappointed in the outcome. And according to how you feel about the project, you end up also using different ways in which to measure performance. You can measure performance against targets, but you can also measure performance in terms of the, the way they, they acquire the land or the extent to which they impacted or not the environment. So it becomes a mess. Performance is a mess. And as a result, performance in these mega projects actually is highly ambiguous. Now, additional challenges in India. It's, it's, it's already complicated in an in a old democracy like the UK or the economy, in the US, I was economic democracy. Additional challenges in India. The first one, by this premature announcement, announcement of hard performance targets in 2006, that makes things even more difficult. So basically, just to that, just to, to explain to people how to, 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 to that it was just a starting point for a conversation. Policy, this allows the use of robust contingency. Big, big issue in India. That these guys are working with contingency that no one is even considered working with in this country. No? They are, they are, and if you are working in the agent that are managing this scheme, and these are very big So basically, when I really sleep, you have to come out next year, you go to Parliament, you have to ask for more money. No one likes that. But if you don't give people generous contingencies, you are creating these uh, Chinese torture that everyone in the you have to ask for more money. So how, how serious is considered thinking about the, moving to an environment where you could operate on, with more uh, profitable contingencies, no? Yeah. Of course, profitable contingencies can have an issue in terms of self Filling prophecies, but we also have to manage. No? Governance way too centralized, big issue in India. No? So these are common pool resources. 
we are we have multiple principles, but somehow there are these principles, in this case Indian Railway, that thinks that it's the master that controls all these decisions. It creates a huge inertia in the system, no? Uh, so it's a mis it's a, it's like we have network rails con controlling the whole high speed communication system. So it becomes way more complicated. Now you come you have to decentralize the governments because the, the nature of the resource is that it, it doesn't be shared by nature, no? The weak goals. These are, I think, is a, because if the goal is about building a, an education price corridor as a means to catalyze social economic growth and uh, in, enable the transformation of, uh, of, of, of India into a manufacturing hub, why is that not also brought into the goal of the agency that is delivering that? But there you decouple, so you tell these people, well, you have to build a railway, and your railway needs to be profitable. And that's it. And all the social economic benefits are with the industrial corridor. It becomes very difficult, because then they are operating in an extremely constrained environment when, when all, someone else is, is reaping all the social economic benefits that are not being factored into the budget that are, is being given to these guys to build the railway in first place, without which nothing is going to happen. So the, the goal should be way more global, no? Scarcity of resources, big, big problem in India, that's so the, cap, the fact that you don't have the capital, you are knocking on the door of the investments in international lenders that then you come with their requirements, and then it creates a tension between the requirements that we, we want, what we want to do and what they are telling you that you have to do. As a result of that, things are even going to change more than perhaps we see changing in more developed uh, countries. So Jaipur will come with lots of requirements, the World Bank will come with lots of requirements, and then it's not just the fact that they require things, but they also sometimes I think they are, they require the wrong things. No? So for example, the contracts. They are, they are using that it was the right thing, extremely rigid contracts. Like, this is it. You are going to build 600 kilometers of railway with a design-built contract, lunchtime, and that thing needs to cost 1.5 million, billion, whatever you can eat, and no more money. Come on, it's not like that. This is construction. There's lots of things with geological uncertainties. Now, we've never, we did, we used to do that in this country, perhaps 20 years ago, when if all projects would end, in, end up in forest, because the contractors will start firing letters that they want to be compensated because they didn't respond to my, my request for information on time, because the geological conditions are different from the ones that you told me that they are, and it created a horrible environment to work with. Very, very negative environment, as opposed to, and people will, instead of, um, of channeling all their energy and creativity into the project, are just channeling all the creativity and, the, and energy into trying to litigate and fight for small bills. Who's going to pay for that? Well, I'll, I'll, this is a conversation that you really have to have with, with the World Bank, that it's the, these commercial approaches, they are relevant well because of corrupt markets. Uh, 30% Japanese sourcing, big problem again, no? The, the, if you are, you, are, you are operating with Japan, so they say, well, yeah, we can give you the money, but by the way, 30% of the materials needs to be sourced in Japan. And by the way, the consortium that are going to do the work, the leading partners, needs to be Japanese. By the way, the Japanese contractors are not interested. They don't want to, to bid for work in India because, in part, because the contracts are too rigid. They don't like the risk. Well, then you, you issue the, the, the tender documents and you don't get competition. No one is, you know, the, the, the local contractors, the China find Japanese companies interested to bid for the work, and then probably a procurement process that could last three, four months ends up lasting one year or two years further delaying the project. Big, big issue, no? So ultimately, and then of course you have a lack of trust for historical reasons, or fair, right or wrong, that all these, uh, India, the government of India has this reputation that it's not one of the most uh, uh, integral in the world in terms of uh, integrity, so it will be to corrupt, corruption. And so what they decide to do, now we have to set up a vigilant uh, officer, the police, bring the police into the headquarters of the project, and you go from one extreme to the other, where no one is going to help, because if I help him, I, someone is saying that I'm helping him because I want the bribe from you. Well, I just wanted to help, I just wanted to get things 
then the Malaya police officer uh, breathing on my neck every day, so I'm not going to help you. I'm going to write a letter, and the letter is that go to the MD, and then you have to talk to the MD, and something that we could sort out in five minutes in a conversation at the coffee break is going to last two months. Big, big issue with that. So, to end on a positive note, <laughs> recommendations. Definitely, I would argue that you, you need to change the narrative. That it is so important for the country, I think it's silly to decouple the social economic benefits that the corridor is creating from the corridor, the, the dedicated strike uh, corridor as a piece of infrastructure. No? It's, it's part of the goal. No? This is like separating the two brothers right from day one when they could actually become be way more grown, uh, happier, and be happier if they would be able to talk together, no? Explore more decentralized government structures. I think this is a, a big fight in India, no? The, this Ministry of Railways, this is a, a monster, really, no? Well, one of the largest organizations of the, in the world, no? A very, lots of vested interests to, to persuade them to, to, to break the umbilical cord with this baby. Empowered agents, that would be ideal, but I'm not, I really don't understand how I can't feel happening, but that is what we want to do, you know? More proportionality between cost and benefit, you know? The whole in incentive, the salary, these people are the top managers. They are, in, 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 in other countries, you see these people being very generously remunerated, you know, in incentive, commercial bonds, things like that. But you could have more, uh, more modern uh, packages to make sure entice people to stay. As a result of that, what we see is that you get the top management job into these agencies that will run in this corridor, you stay there for three years, and then you, you, get, you, you are always thinking about the promotion of where so you can progress on your career, as opposed to create a loyalty to this organization. I want to, if this thing is going to stay there for 20, 30 years, why can't I just create a, an environment also that, that in this, from an individual perspective is going to nurture me where I want to stay. Right now, they, don't say they are not breaking these allegiances to the, pattern, to the father organization, the parent, which is the Ministry of the Railways. So more clarity in roles and boundaries, no? So who, lots of people controlling the design. You end up not knowing exactly who wants the design. More flexible, you need to introduce more flexibility in the institutional environment. Robust contingencies for one. More flexible supplier contracts. They went from one extreme, which was all reimbursable, cost and materials, we pay everything, to the other extreme, which is rigid fixed price lump sum. You need to let the pendulum go somewhere in the middle, no? Well, first, where they were was not good, where they are definitely is also not good. Mm -hmm. Softer performance targets, I see that happening, and I'm very glad. Give a bit more autonomy to the local group, which will, all that at the end, what does this boil down to? Basically, it's a fundamental change to the social contract. That's what, uh, it, 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 what needs to happen. All these things, and it's about changing the social contract in which these large things happen. It's about to create environments that are going to encourage mutual trust, reciprocity, collaboration, cooperation. Nothing of that is going to happen unless we start making some institutional changes. So, in this environment, which is so challenging, so difficult, what is performance? I think right now these guys are performing really well because performance basically is just the fact they are still alive, they are still there, that they managed to acquire the land, the fact that it, they acquire the finance, the wealth, that they are performing very well. That for me is performance. Really. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gill. Actually, <coughs> I really enjoyed that uh, presentation, and I must compliment you on, uh, you know, quite a lot of institutional flavor and subtlety, because I'm familiar with this story. Okay. Uh, you know, having been in the relevant position for the last 10 years. And actually, I think um, it would be good to make it into a movie, you know, because <laughs> the real problem is that uh, the Indian Railways is such a closed body. Yep. I don't think the public at large is aware 
of all of this. So the best way to do that is to make it into a movie. But anyway, I look forward to uh, seeing the actual write-up mm -hmm. because this is actually a very, and you know many, I believe the point about uh, restructuring the system, I don't know if it's correct, uh, maybe you, you're better informed. I saw in the newspapers that the new government has appointed someone to look at the structure of the railway board. But now, um, let's yeah. see, I mean, it's always, a new government is always an opportunity yeah. to take a lot of things looking at it fresh. But this has been a long-standing, really long-standing problem, and some of the issues you raised really do need to be gone into uh, at great length. So thank you very much. Now, I think we are going to ask Oliver if he wishes to uh, take up some time to either comment on uh, or we throw it open for discussion, but it's up to you. Yeah, I think in the interest of time, I, I'd much rather... Okay, well, you get, the, I'm sure there'll be questions thrown at you. So uh, with those words, uh, I think we just throw it open uh, to discussions. I'm not sure. There's somebody with a, with a mic, so if you raise your hand, someone will get you in due course. Uh, right here, the gentleman sitting here. And after that, the gentleman sitting there. This is, in transport terms, not an optimized <laughs> arrangement, but... <laughs> is there another mic or just one mic? Just one. Okay, okay. It's fine. Hmm? Yeah. That's Suman Berry, yes. Ashish, uh, just one question. Uh, I may have missed. Can you speak into points. the mic? Yeah. Uh, I may have. Uh, ha it's okay. Uh, Ashish, I may have missed the finer points when you, uh, when you were doing the presentation. What is the essential difference between the uh, policy of the previous government and the present government? Is, the, is there is any qualitative difference? Oh, you, uh, you're addressing Ashish? Yeah, sure. I, I don't think it is professional for me as a career civil servant to start <laughs> analyzing <laughs> uh, the quality of policies of the previous government and the present government. But yes, analytics, uh, the, 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 the observers and uh, analysts say that uh, um, that's the good thing about India, that we do not see a major overhaul in policies when governments change, which affords predictability, and that is important for investors. Uh, one important decision that has come out of the recent government is that they are looking for an alternative to the Planning Commission. Uh, the details and the broad contours of the alternative is not known. Um, the government uh, possibly has uh, some, uh, some reasons on why it thinks there should be a new alternative body, and uh, it will be difficult for me to make a formal comment on that at this point of time. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that the previous government did function under extremely stressful times, uh, global stressful times, as I would say. And the uh, new government has taken charge at a time when uh, the stresses have not completely eased. The unpredictability in the global economic environment continue. And uh, we need to see, 100 days is, uh, is, a, is a fairly short time to start pronouncing judgments on, on governments, but uh, I'm sure uh, the government would do its best to take the best foot forward. So well, let me start by uh, complimenting uh, IGC India Central uh, for, as it were, having both commissioned this body of work and also having uh, organized the session, which was absolutely gripping. Uh, and if I could be just allowed a series of responses to various points, because it's really been both very rich and very heterogeneous. I think the first point is really, and if the chair wishes to comment, uh, I'd welcome that. Uh, you know, what are really the differences between large infrastructure that Nuno talked about and rural infrastructure? I mean, they are trying to offer the same services, but are they so different as to be really, um, for research purposes, qualitatively different? And in particular, um, you know, uh, when uh, the chair and I were sort of cutting our teeth, the flavor of the month was uh, rigorous cost-benefit analysis. But then in, in, uh, in the interim, people began to feel that that was very much planners' preferences and really the logic of, of community participation ought to be the mechanism for project choice, project location, particularly where rural infrastructure, I'm not suggesting for a moment uh, with respect to, uh, to kind of big infrastructure. So um, I really appreciate Oliver, uh, Oliver's um, you know, thoughts on, as it were, uh, how you would characterize uh, what you have looked at so carefully in the rural space. 
whose choice, whose preference set is it, is it reflecting, and is that, um, you know, optimal, suboptimal, and both from a, a kind of uh, infrastructure point of view and also from a um, social preference point of view. I think the second point, uh, the thought that went through my mind, um, and I guess Nuno would be the person to respond, is I wonder now living in Europe whether the moment of the impartial regulator has not passed. Because when you see, for example, what this country is having to do in terms of energy choice, etc., it seems as though these things are back with the politicians and that the moment of the regulator had really been you know, post-privatization. It's a question. You're looking at, at this issue, Nuno, you know, uh, in, in a developed country context as well. So uh, is it your sense that the notion of the impartial regulator, who can be trusted by both sides in order to uh, ensure that, um, uh, that um, whatever the, te the technical term is, that the renegotiation, once the asset is in place, won't, take, uh, won't occur? Has that moment passed, and is India, in a sense, in that sense, perhaps, um, uh, well, uh, it, it may still be appropriate for India, but I, w I would just be interested uh, in uh, where the debate is here. Um, th three quick points, uh, additional points, if I may. The f you talked about um, the challenging, uh, the, thing, uh, the challenging international environment, and yet, according to um, you know, the, the Federal Reserve, we're still in the period of the savings glut. So at one level, this ought to be the best time to attract international finance. Uh, and this comes back to really Nuno's point, which is what is the unique selling, what is the USP, as we would say in India, of India in a world which is awash with savings, has massive infrastructure needs, but the system of financial intermediation has really uh, collapsed. And, no, no, um, y you know, uh, India is a wannabe Superman, but it is what it is, and so it's not China. You didn't talk about the long-term benefits of having to do all this negotiation, but, you know, you're living in a country which has had to do this kind of negotiation for, for some time and has been learning, etc. I mean, is it all cost, or at the, e other, at the end of the day, are there actually tangible benefits in terms of the i core, in terms of decisions, or is, is all of the infrastructure rent, in a sense, getting dissipated in this process of negotiation? Absolutely. Yeah, there were a number of uh, points there, no? Uh, so, the f on the first one, on the large versus the rural infrastructure, I haven't done that research on rural infrastructure, but I was uh, looking to your presentation. I think what you have with rural infrastructure is from a management, I come from a management uh, background, so is what we have more modularity, no? So, large schemes are very integral, which basically means that if you have, if you face an obstacle, Perhaps the whole scheme cannot move ahead because of that little obstacle. No, like for, you can't uh, get planning application for a piece of land, and suddenly the World Bank is not writing the check for the whole thing because it's a, because the whole railway cannot run and then stop and then run again. No, I guess in that regard, uh, rural infrastructure programs will be more flexible, and uh, that's not what that's the reason also why multinational corporations like to create modular structures to decouple components. To, make, to become more resilient and robust to adversity along the way, no? So I, I can properly manage in, in so far you, you standardize the interface between components and you, you agree the rules of the game, actually rural, rural infrastructure programs would have, would have structures more amenable to show high performance in a traditional sense, than uh, large infrastructure schemes, no? That are more integral and heavier to move, no? no so that's one, one question, no? In terms of uh, the issue about who can be trusted, no? I think there's, uh, yeah, I, I can see two, um, like, you know, like in, in, in the tennis game, you have the figure of the empire, no? Because both parties want to win. So, 
and someone needs to mediate the game and make sure that uh, we are going to have a fair game and the, the best is going to win. You know? So I, I guess in, a, in large infrastructure development, we w it's important that society, democratic societies have empires, no? because one party wants to get to, 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 to make as much money as possible for the less possible investment. The other one wants to get as much as possible for less investment. No? So we need people to mediate this process. Uh, in the UK, we have something. We have the role, the parliament. No, you can say many things, but if you think about the high-speed two, for example, as far as a, a land acquisition is concerned, there will be lots of debates. People fundamentally disagreeing. I don't want to sell my land. You want to compulsively buy my land, and ultimately you can lodge a petition and uh, you present your, you table your ar your arguments in parliament, and they, the parliament, the committee will decide. Some people in this country would love the parliament to go to. to to move, would like to remove the parliament from, from the process, I think actually I'm glad we have this parliament because it's preferable, because it's part of the property rights, no? that you have to have a right to defend uh, your, to present your arguments. No? Now, in India it's more complicated because you don't have de this empire. No? You have courts, but the courts can be very slow. So you start doing the project and then you are still acquiring the land at the same time, which is a more messy project. I would prefer them to have an instrument like a hybrid bill we have in this country that you go with the totality and once you acquire, at some point your hybrid bill gets uh, the royal assent, now you have all the money, you have the, the resources and now you get it done. No? India is more complicated. The other one is that I think there's a vulnerability with the corridor. Once it's done, which is which is about being captured by the elites, no? because the corridor can be extremely interesting to create uh, uh, opportunities for, for profit along the corridor. But uh, I, right now there's a, a, a discussion that still needs to happen about who's going to govern this agency that will own these corridors and will charge the fees. And, and uh, that needs to, ha well, hopefully it will happen in a way that is not going to be captured by the elites and then the socioeconomic benefits are not going to spread as much as they could spread, no? And in that regard, also the fact that they are not thinking all the time on the totality itself is a vulnerability of governance in the system because if, the, if it was about the golden quadrilateral as a whole, we would have a story about the whole India. And so it was a pan-India project in a, in a and, and you, it would involve the whole, all the states. Right now you have money from the center going to, to corridors, and so there's already an asymmetry there. So those are vulnerabilities that I see in the system, this lack of uh, in empires, no? Uh, on, the on the international finance, well, that's not my, I'm not an expert on those issues. I, I just see that countries are all competing with each other these days for, for capital. It's a fight for capital and, uh, and it becomes complicated because these, uh, what I think India sometimes, well, the politicians don't want to admit is that ca capitalists, they hate the planning risk with democracies. So when India says we are going to get all these things through PPPs, well, forget it, it's not going to happen or you have to give them extremely high returns okay. because they don't, Capitalists, not even in this country, they want to take the planning risk, they don't, like, they don't like the, the, cap, the construction risk associated with democracy. What they tell, keep telling the UK government is, you build it and then you put it for sale and then we buy it. But until you build it, we are not going to talk with, to you. And India keeps insisting that, well, they are going to come, they are going to get the planning out of uh, planning consent, they are going to build it. I think it's not going to happen, to be honest. They don't want to do it in the UK, why would they do it in the India? It's way too risky, or, or they are going to, or the, pa the price that I would pay for that would be outrageous, which is the dis debate that we are having in this country when, they, when, when the government decided that they want to have the private sector to build these sewage that costs four billion and people say that uh, it's going to be a rip-off. Um, I didn't get the last question, but I also spoke already too much, so. <laughs> Oh, actually, can I ask a question? I mean, it's a very interesting point because this has been debated in India. I mean, we, we started down the PPP route uh, and in one sense we had, we overcame the earlier skepticism that nobody would come and a lot of people came, okay? 
But actually, every one of them, or most of them, are running into all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And part of the problems relates to their perception that a 30-year contract just is too inflexible. And you should have some mechanisms for flexibility. Uh, and so that's an issue. So the first question that I want to ask you is that um, what, what is the best practice in dealing with long-term contracts where you have transparent flexibility so that everybody bidding knows that this is the flexibility. I mean, you can't call it flexibility if you have a bid, and then when you run into a problem, you come along and say, oh, by the way, I just want to change the terms. Mm -hmm. Because whoever lost the bid would immediately take you to court, saying yeah, <laughs> you yeah. change the terms. This is one, one issue. The second issue is that, you know, uh, sort of do it yourself. I mean, that assumes that the fiscal resources are there, or it assumes that what the government borrows for infrastructure projects is not part uh, of its fiscal deficit, or you set up public sector corporations that borrow without a government guarantee. Not clear to me that in India they'd be able to do so. So the argument that you know the uh, private sector PPP won't work, you better do it yourself. And what that really means is you better settle for half the infrastructure mm. that you otherwise could. So that's a tough one also. Yeah, I guess what not is we have to be horses for courses, no? So there will be projects that can be PPP though, yeah, and sure. others that know. will not be, no? Clearly, clearly. We have some is issues with uh, flexibility in long-term contracts in this country <coughs> because we have lots of PPPs with hospitals and schools. And then one thing the government did not anticipate is that uh, the owners of these PPPs will transact them, will sell uh, portfolios of PPPs to others. So as a result of that, we now have organizations that have amassed large uh, portfolios of the PPPs in schools and hospitals, are benefiting from all these economies of scope and scale, and the government say, well, but you are making way more profit than we ever anticipated, so could we renegotiate? And <laughs> no way. Uh, uh, so these are sort of CDOs of PPPs, is it? Yeah, so it's, uh, PPP is complicated now, but um, yeah, I think ultimately, it's where, uh, where, when, I, when the planning risk is very high, I think that's when you start paying dearly for private sector involvement, mm -hmm. when the planning no, risk no, is very high. Okay. And the construction risk I is I shouldn't high. monopolize. Somebody, uh, uh, can, I, can I just come in if I want to? Yep, sure. Please. Yeah, actually, I disagree with you. Because, uh, you know, I think the point that you're making is a valid point, that under the circumstances, saying that the burden of, pub, of, of infrastructure investment will come through the PPP route is proving not to be a credible proposition. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Indian state, especially the central government, has not invested in infrastructure increasingly over the years is a deliberate policy choice. The fiscal deficit is not coming because the state has maxed out invest in, in public investment. Mm -hmm. The Indian, the, the central government uh, spends on salaries. It spends on maybe nice things, mm -hmm. health, education, etc. That's the claim. We don't see the outcomes. So there is a policy choice there. The, the, the government of India can choose mm -hmm. to go back into the business of public investment infrastructure. The states of India, Bihar is a very good example. Bihar runs a revenue surplus. It does not borrow to consume. It invests 5% of its GDP. But it doesn't invest in the kind of infrastructure you're speaking of. It invests in irrigation and other things, and right and proper rural roads, etc., etc. So broadly speaking, if you look at the states of India, they are in the business of public investment, largely in infrastructure. The central government is not, but by limited point is that's a policy choice. And there is 100,000 crores a year to be had by changing that policy choice, in my view, by running the same levels of fiscal deficit, but by, by, by not borrowing to consume and by borrowing to invest. Just to address very quickly Suman's point, um, you, know, it's, you said modular versus integral, and I had a part question for you, part comment. It seems much easier to access the savings slot for projects of a modular nature. Uh, it's not difficult in India for Walmart to come in and find the financing. It's much more difficult to get money for integral projects. Uh, this is something that seems to be true across all emerging economies, including China, for which very good reason China puts its own money into its public investment infrastructure. Uh, so is there a way in which these integral projects in, in financial terms can be modularized? Yeah. Uh, and it'd be interesting to know how. Yeah, that's a very good point. On the same subject? Okay, well then let him answer this one then. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess
guess in a way you are trying, isn't it? Because the Golden, for example, when you think about the Golden Quadrilateral, the totality, it's six corridors, no? So we can see already some modularization going on because the country decided to start with the first two. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think now that they are starting to look to uh, others now. And the, even the, mod, the, man, the money that is one, the, you have Japan financing one, two, well, one, two thirds of one, and you have the World Bank financing uh, the, the other one in part. No? So, and then you, have, you are trying to get the PPP for the last leg. So in a way, if, I think it's just the scale that is different, but in a way, you, you s I guess we could argue that the people that masterminded the whole thing were at a modular approach in mind, because if they would ask the World Bank to finance the whole thing, or Japan to finance the whole thing, it would never happen, and they end up actually finding a way in which they could find money to get the different corridors being funded by. It's just that the scale is different, but the modularity is already there. Yeah, yeah. So I have a quick question, uh, probably for Ashish, but uh, because it's based on Ratin Roy's comment, uh, even you can chip in. So, uh, so the two points which I understand from uh, Ratin Roy's uh, well basic speech was, uh, so we do need FDI in order to have all this infrastructure uh, because there are other limitations on other uh, financing. Uh, but uh, well, the, our reputation of our regulatory agencies, or like in general, uh, is, is not good. So based on that, a quick question would be, uh, looking at like other developed countries or even developing countries across the world, uh, what are the quick regulatory changes uh, that, uh, well, uh, you know, you think India should have? Like, you know? Thank you, Vikas. Uh, I think uh, what, what the government of India is looking at and what should be looked at is the issue of doing ease of doing business in India. We, we rank quite low, and I was a little surprised that countries like Latvia are way above us, but probably we are too big in size, both in geographical terms and in terms of population. So ease of doing business is something very important, and that is high on priority of the government, and uh, we are looking into it. I would beg to slightly differ with uh, uh, the director, NIPFP, uh, on, on the options available for financing infrastructure. Of course, uh, uh, state is there, and it's not a policy choice, because uh, the government of the day takes a call on, it, it has a bag of revenues. It decides how much of it has to go into, uh, into education, health, how much of it has to go into uh, financing infrastructure. Uh, now those, pr uh, those priorities, uh, one can debate in parliament, but uh, you know, uh, it, is, it is difficult to say that this policy is right and that policy is wrong. Now, uh, we have, we do realize that commercial banks are saturated in financing infrastructure. We, we, we do realize that, and that's the reason why the government of India has brought out uh, now the infrastructure debt funds. There are seven of them coming in collaboration with the private sector. Now, they are supposed to take over projects that have completed the, uh, the construction phase and have started receiving revenue. So they are de risk projects. So when, once these uh, IDFs take over such projects, the, that much equivalent amount from the banks, which they must have lent for setting up the infrastructure projects, would be unlocked. And they would be free to be invested elsewhere. So these are some of the things that we are considering. FDI is very important. But I, I personally feel we need to simplify the way things are in government at the moment. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Relating to the Delhi Mumbai corridor project, uh, it was mentioned in this presentation that the involvement of local people is important to, uh, to realize institutional environment more flexible. But uh, I think sometimes a uh, larger number of project members will lead to uh, more complicated and longer time negotiation. So uh, what do you think is an effective aid way to involve these people into negotiation? Um, yeah, so I think I, I think it's it's um, interesting in that for the projects that, that that I'm currently studying, the approach taken was one not to involve like any level of the of the local government and just to impose some some strict rules. And and that goes back to another question about like are these rules efficient? I mean, it's clear to see that the one advantage that they bring is the fact that the opportunities for uh, corruption or for local elites to kind of affect the, the allocation 
are much more limited if you just impose that villages only qualify for a road if they exceed a certain population <coughs> threshold. Um, I mean, it's clear that in terms of transparency um, and, and kind of ob objective um, um, kind of fairness in the allocation, th that, is a big, that is a big advantage. Now, India has not really kind of delivered like large, well, medium scale uh, rural infrastructure uh, through uh, the, the local uh, democratic institutions. So the panchayats are running NREGA, but the infrastructure work that takes place under NREGA is really, really small scale. Um, it, it doesn't really cover, it doesn't even cover like connecting your village to the main road. Um, and I mean, I think the, 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 the jury is out on, on, on what is uh, kind of what is the most efficient model, but there are existing, there is existing work on other countries that really suggests that these local uh, kind of participative models are, are very vulnerable to, to elite capture. And I think that, uh, I mean, in the, in, the, in the Indian context, in the context of the Grand Panchayats, this could be a very, a very kind of relevant, relevant concern. Um, I mean, but I think there's a gradual move, like as kind of these large scale flagship programs are slowly reaching their targets and covering ever more unconnected village, villages, I think the kind of next phase of infrastructure development will be more low scale and will probably have a bigger role for the, for the Grand Panchats. It will be very interesting to see like what, what, what happens there. Yes? Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, what I observe whenever we speak about infrastructure in India, be it power, be it roads, it's always about increasing supply because definitely there's a gap in supply, but there's also a great deficit in the kind of quality of infrastructure that we have. So when we talk about power, we have around 20 to 30% AT&C losses. And in terms of roads and all, when we say that PPP is one way to actually get uh, more projects done, uh, the way the projects are allocated to the lowest bidder, the quality of roads is always an issue. So is the new government thinking of anything in terms of increasing the, uh, improving the quality of the infrastructure projects or just increasing the number of infrastructure projects? So it has to be certainly the, both the quality and, uh, and the type of infrastructure projects. Now PPP experience has not been as bad as one would like uh, to presume it to be. Uh, if you have traveled on the East Coast Road in Chennai, it's one of the best drives that you can get in anywhere in the world. If you look at your Delhi airport with all the infirmities that uh, CAG may have pointed out, it is one of the, compare it with Heathrow. You know, you, uh, you are in a world class airports. So uh, PPPs have had difficulties when PPPs were launched in the 2000, early 2000s, people were a little liberal in quoting for it. You know, they probably thought uh, the world would remain constant. And with the uh, global economic impact, they did uh, face an impact. Now, uh, I believe the government of India and the projects, uh, both of them believe that uh, the private uh, operators have to face a haircut. You know, at the end of the day, they have taken a risk. And the risk cannot be met by the taxpayer in all cases. They have to take some impact of it, and the government would have to work with them to see how better they can be enabled to perform even more. So this is, and the third issue is about regulators. Now regulators may uh, see, uh, uh, there, there is a lot of criticism of course, the director and IPFP said that it's not a good idea the way it is in India. Uh, but uh, you look at the regulators in UK, look at the regulators in India, try for example. The poorest of the poor can operate a mobile phone. It's affordable. You don't pay to receive SMSs. Now somewhere our regulator has done his job well. I don't know whether it's the market, or maybe, the, maybe the former uh, deputy chairman may like to support me on this, but I, do feel <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel that the regulators in India, some of them have done an exceptional job. They have understood what are the priorities of the government and they have gone about ensuring that the market does its job. At the same time, the interests of the poor are protected. Where else, uh, you know, in India, you don't, uh, you know, I receive an SMS, I don't pay for it. Here, I, I'm very scared to operate. I keep my phone closed <laughs> whenever I'm in UK. 
Now, I am not complaining about it. Probably the, the market functions a little differently here. But the poorest of the peer, you have increased teledensity there. And people are genuinely, uh, you know, uh, air travel has become a little bit affordable uh, than it used to be in the early 2000s. Now, these are some of the benefits that we have in the rail sector, what we are now. In fact, the DE has been pushing very hard for it. And let's see if we get successes that the regulator has to be at arm's length from the government. He has to take decisions based on prudent economic principles. If the government wants to subsidize the services, let it pay up upfront from the budget and subsidize the portion that it wants to do it. That's the principle we are arguing for. But this blanket subsidy, which nobody knows where it goes to, is something that uh, the Ministry of Finance is not very comfortable with at this stage. I'll leave it at this. <laughs> That's a very important point, by the way, and I mean, I think consistently uh, the finance ministry and the planning commission earlier used to take exactly the same view. I don't think it's realized that the total subsidy for rail passenger traffic is uh, in excess of 20,000 crores. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the lack of uh, finances for these big projects is the result of a tariff system. You know, I remember uh, at some point, if you construct the ratio, uh, you talked about the Chinese. But one of the reasons the Chinese are able to do what they do is that they do not subsidize passenger traffic. If you construct an index of freight to passenger traffic, the Chinese index is five times, our, I mean, uh, I forget now which the ratio is, but the degree of distortion in India is five times that of China. You know, their, their passenger traffic is much closer to average costs, and their freight traffic correspondingly much less. And therefore, you don't get the switch to road and use of diesel and for, I mean, the tariff system for the Indian Railway is a disgrace. I mean, we've said that in the couple of the previous plans. Actually, one of the progressive things that has happened, uh, I think the previous government had approved, and I don't know if they've actually set it up, the Rail Tariff Authority, meant to be, hmm? I think they've notified it, but they haven't appointed anyone. So they must be doing the, that's what I was told. Uh, sir, uh, but I, I believe the cabinet's decision was, it's not a fully arm's length. No, it's not, that's true. No, 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 I mean, you can't get, as he said, you better go bit by yes. bit. It's not a fully arm's length, it's sort of actually advisory rather than, but I think it's actually yes, being it's set up for the first time. So if, if it's well run, at least people will be able to say how distant are the actual tariffs from what a bunch of non-fully independent guys recommend. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I agree with the view that I think overall the experience with PPPs has been good. And I think we've been caught in the last two years not being able to respond to a sudden mess of uh, problems. And one of the very big reasons is this, this vigilance point with Professor Gill raised that, you know, it's when there's a problem, I mean, I think the way you described it was very convincing because it made the Indian position absurd mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm trying to help. But you're absolutely right. If you were an Indian civil servant, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> nobody will give you immunity. Yeah. Now, where, I mean, some people, particularly business guys say, why don't you leave this to the regulator? But actually, renegotiating contracts is not a regulator's job. <coughs> so it's, it's really not clear to them. This is something we, at least I think, we failed to find a satisfactory solution. Uh, but we did identify the problem. And you know, it's a huge issue. So if there is any sort of best practice uh, around the world, uh, that would be the single most useful input into Indian uh, development. And since you're in management, I mean, if you find a good answer, send me an email. <laughs> send him one. He's actually in the government <laughs> and has to deal with these things. But I think that's very interesting. Uh, I, maybe, I mean, maybe we have one minute if somebody wants to ask a question. Uh, I don't propose to sum up what is such a rich discussion other than to thank the panelists. So you've got my time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, this is going to be a short question. <clears throat> um, I think this kind of ties into what you were just saying in terms of um, best practice. Uh, we've got, uh, this is, uh, I'm talking about power infrastructure, and if you look at what's happening in Europe, there are legacy support systems, 
And in that sense, developing countries have the advantage of leapfrog leapfrogging and not really making the same sort of, not mistakes, but choices as, uh, 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 choices as the ones that have been made in Europe in, in, with, with regard to grid parity and how I'm talking about power infrastructure. So in terms of, uh, even in terms of, you know, the subsidies that are offered, or as you just discussed, the sort of system that we have in, in the railway, uh, are, we, are we really going by best practice? Are we really learning from mistakes made in, let's say, other countries? Are we, because uh, even in terms of how much you pay for a, a unit of electricity that's generated uh, by coal versus renewable, we still have a lot of subsidies that are being doled out. But right now in Europe, that's changing, and that's something that we can learn from. So infrastructure-wise, we do have that advantage that we haven't really made choices that have been made in Europe. We don't have legacy support mechanisms. So how forward-looking are we in terms of you know, infrastructure? Are we just trying to you know, reach a certain level, or are we also trying to get it right while we reach a certain level? If I'm not clear. Well, <laughs> I think we've got, well, a anyone uh, can, uh, can ask. Uh, from, the, from the little experience I have, uh, best practices are important but uh, india is truly a unique country and uh, uh, it's it's our block implementation often becomes difficult yes the planning commission and the ministry of finance work on the on the models we do look at various other options um, and certainly the objective is to improve the quality of provisioning the cost of uh, accessing that infrastructure and its durability but uh, we may not necessarily always adopt uh, the best practices, so-called best practices that we, uh, that we may have seen in other developed countries. Uh, I, I would just like to put in, uh, put in a last word. Um, I have been in government for last 17 years and I have seen uh, the quality of Indian state grow remarkably. Now uh, the credit for this goes to the political leadership which is often abused and the credit for this goes to the people who have, who have always signaled what they want uh, by being a very intelligent electorate. I am confident that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it is only a matter of time. The pace may be something that you would disagree uh, with, uh, you, uh, you could debate upon with me, but it's a matter of time that, uh, we, and, and uh, being a democracy, uh, what uh, Professor Gill mentioned, has another unique advantage. It gives us very durable solutions. It doesn't give us a uh, solution in a jiffy, which of course gets contested, and then you have a major problem thereafter. But we get durable solutions, which I think stands in good stead for our or for our country. Very briefly, I mean, of course, I agree with everything you say. Uh, I, I, I'd better otherwise I'd be you know, a pessimist. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think there is there is a problem which we should not single out infrastructure for. As you said, we did a good job. India is very bad at last mile, and that's as true of the private sector about IT as anything else. You know, and we have to figure out why this is. Uh, maybe it's a change in business process that we need to wor worry about. We need to worry about conformance. We need to worry about institutions. But we don't do lifestyle properly. We don't do it well in PDS. We don't do it well in education. We don't do well in health. And we don't do that that well in infrastructure, which is why the quality and maintenance of many of the assets we create is lower than it ought to be. I think the good news is that this is recognized. I think the bad news is we don't quite know, frankly, what to do about it. But we have enough examples of best practice within the country. For instance, in his state, Tamil Nadu, you know, midday meal schemes work well. In Chhattisgarh, PDS works well. In Gujarat, I'm told infrastructure, the quality of infrastructure maintenance is better than in other states. So one solution to this last mile problem perhaps is this increase in this area of what the Prime Minister calls cooperative federalism, which is if we're able to go down to the states and involve them more, at the sub-national levels of government. Now, look at these schemes he's describing. I mean, all India, mega. These are imperial schemes. And imperial schemes to be durable have to be made sub-imperial. And Britain's good at that. They've done a good job of it, even though they're a small country. America has not been so good. So perhaps that's one way we need to go. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank on your behalf all the panelists for what has been, at least I thought, a very, very informative and educated discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Have you seen this report done by Rakesh Mohan on transportation? No, it's on the website of Science. Uh, uh, you know, since I've left the government, I forgot it. I took that day to go to my email. Uh, 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 you want to write it? Can I do it? So that is for the research of the post office? Or? I think it's very active. They don't really think it's very good.
Monty has to give a whole talk. Said, we must go ahead. 45 minutes. Mm. At that point, both the finance ministry and the planning commission were very unhappy with the tie rate. Mm. In fact, we said, look, let's just close bonds mm. and borrow in a commercial bond. But the airline sector is. But the trouble is, under the law, the railways can't borrow. I met the minister, so that is what he's arguing. Yeah. That is changing. That is changing. No, it's not. That, that would be a real reform. <laughs> Read, read Rakesh Mohan. I had, I had suggested some time ago when I was in the planning commission that look, I just let's got to have it, but I have a hard copy. Let's have a public sector. Let the trains be run by Wikipedia. Let the trains be run by Wikipedia. Let the trains be run by Wikipedia. And that would also remove the pressure of the trains run to the village. How do you get paid for this? Unfortunately, you know, railways, 1.6 million people, all unions. This is just impossible. Nice, you did a very good job. I was wondering how you're going to handle this civil servant problem, but a model answer. Okay. You'd like a coffee, but because you have, you have to work. I no, I have to give a bloody lecture. <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, I mean, are you on the website or something? Yeah, I, I sent. I sent Testing one two one two. Okay, I mean, actually, yeah, yeah. you really have got inside the the skin of. Yeah, we interviewed the But you know, one of the interesting in things is yeah, that yeah, in the last so several years, the, the railway really yeah, chairman yeah, has changed every year. USP I mean, that's what the CEO of the United States is friends with. Yeah, we can see that. Our railway is now in the Railway is as a gross revenue of $20 billion a year. Something like that. I mean, you see, it's being run in an idiotic manner. Yeah, that's uh, something that, yeah, because even the guy that was running the FCCC, Mr. Gupta, that was, uh, and then he moved them out to uh, No, because they, you see, they, they, set up, they set up this thing as a yeah, sub unit, yeah. but without autonomy, without ability yeah, to borrow, and stuff. under the thumb of the railway people. So the first thing this guy wants to do is to become back to the yeah, railway exactly. people. Yeah. That 30% tied Japanese number you use, mm -hmm. where do you get that from? Uh, well, it's on the website, Jaika's website. I see that speaking from Shall I transfer the new PDF to the other USB? Testing one two one two. Should I transfer Testing the old one two one two. The new PDF to the old USB? So it's all on one or Testing one two. Okay. As long as it's on here. Do you know? Uh, testing one two. In case there's confusion. Yeah. So this is two just the old one. This is the old one. Oh, 
Yeah. I imagine one of them's going to be stood up. Testing, one, two, testing, one, two, one, two. Thank you. 